Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased to join you during the holy month of Ramadan. This evening I speak to you as someone who spent much of his life in public service, as a combat soldier, a congressman, a governor, an assistant to the President of the United States, and the first Secretary of Homeland Security, the department created after September 11, 2001, to help secure and protect America from future terrorist attacks. And during many of these years, I've been a strong advocate of freedom, justice, and democracy in Iran, because I come from a land whose government is a government of liberty regulated by law, a land whose founding father, George Washington, believed a place where human happiness and moral duty are inseparably connected, or as President Abraham Lincoln declared, a government of the people, for the people, and by the people. I cherish America's values and promises not because it separates us or distinguishes us from the rest of the world, but because I think it creates an intangible and unbreakable bond with decent and freedom-loving people wherever they live. Freedom and democracy, respect for individual rights and, and peace are universal values that most people cherish. And those of us who embrace those values are obligated to stand up and stand up and fight strongly against the dark forces of tyranny and injustice. And for that, and many reasons, I'm proud to stand with the Iranian resistance, Mrs. Maryam Rajavi and the Iranian people, in their embrace and pursuit of these universal values. I have, I have chosen to speak out against the oppression of the tyrannical regime that today rules the once proud nation of Islam, of Iran, excuse me, and are honored to join you in that cause today. Everyone in this room knows the savagery, the violence, and the inhumanity of the Iranian government. This is a regime that brutally repressed and suppresses its own population, its fellow Muslims. In 2009, when millions of disenchanted Iranians rose up to demand a democratic form of government, the Mullah's forces descended down upon the defenseless protesters with knives and bullets and repression. Many families of the MEK have lost loved ones. I've had the good fortune over the years to meet with many of the families. I've seen the photographs. I've watched the tears flow from sorrowed faces. In fact, tens of thousands have been executed by the tyrannical regime in Iran over the past 30 years. How ironic that the gathering tonight coincides with the 25th anniversary of the massacre of 30,000 prisoners of conscience, Muslims all, based on a fatwa by Ayatollah Khomeini. The Mullah's legacy for the Iranian people has been nothing but suffering, death, decay, destruction, poverty, and pain. Its record is equally ruthless and vicious when it comes to its relationship with the international community. Since its inception, Tehran has created and fund funded extremist groups around the world, most notably Hezbollah, but there are so many others. The killing of innocent Muslims and non-Muslims is embraced by these radical fundamentalists. Terrorism is part of the Iranian regime's DNA. It has used Syria, Yemen, Libya, Iraq, Afghanistan, Lebanon, and other places as recruitment markets and alternative battlegrounds in an attempt to prevent the blossoming of democracy in the region during the Arab Spring. Nowhere is this more evident than in Syria where Assad's murderous regime has killed more than 100,000 innocent men, women, and children while enjoying the full, complete financial, military, and political backing of Tehran. 
I stand with Madame Rajavi and everyone here and commend the people of Syria and the Free Syrian Army for their valiant resistance and perseverance in the face of unspeakable inhumanity. The Iranian regime will continue on this path of death and destruction. Its attempts to acquire weapons of mass destruction are meant to preserve its decaying rule in Iran in the face of a disenchanted population. If the Iranian regime acquires nuclear weapons, make no mistake about it, the world can expect it to spurn more extremism, terrorism, and fundamentalism. And what makes the threat even more dangerous, and frankly what brings us, many of us together tonight, is that the mullahs commit and justify their crimes against the Iranian people and fellow Muslims and their enemies in the name of Islam. They stone women to death, torture, rape, carry out draconian punishments such as limb amputations and public executions, and they do it all in the name of Islam. The mullah's Islam is one of brutality, vengeance, and ruthlessness. The genuine Islam, as I've come to understand, and all of you in this room know, is one of compassion, tolerance, and forgiveness. Virtually every chapter of the Holy Quran begins with, in the name of God, the most merciful and the most compassionate. That is why we are gathering today. That is why this gathering is so important. We all know that Madame Rajavi, the MEK, and the freedom-loving Iranians are devout Muslims and reject the mullahs and their perverted expression and exploitation of their faith. That is why the courageous men and women at Ashraf and Liberty must be shielded from the unholy fundamentalists who seek their destruction and demise. I'm reminded of the words of another fearless leader several years ago, Benazar Bhutto, who said, you can imprison a man, but not an idea. You can exile a man, but not an idea. You can execute a man, but not an idea. What they all need to know What the leaders in Iraq and Iran need to know is they can conspire to imprison, torture, exile, or murder the residents who oppose them, particularly in Liberty and Ashraf, but they will never, never extinguish their commitment to the cause of freedom and the universal values of justice, tolerance, and equality. Uh, I am here because the mullahs in Iran have distorted, abused, and dishonored a great religion embraced by over a billion people around the world. I am here to remind my government that it promised to protect and defend the residents of Ashraf and Liberty under the Fourth Geneva Convention, and tragically and unconscionably to date have failed to do so. I'm here because the Iraqi government has conspired with Iran to terrorize, harass, and murder the residents of Ashraf and Liberty, and to call on my government to remove them immediately from Iraqi soil to safe haven, where the stalled resettlement UN efforts can begin in earnest. And if they cannot remove them from Iraq, let them return to Ashraf, and if they will not let them return to Ashraf, call on the Maliki government to provide them defense at Camp Liberty until the United Nations can proceed quickly with its resettlement efforts. I join with you to remind the government of the United States and all countries and people who embrace the values of liberty, equality, and fraternity of the words of Winston Churchill, who once observed, it is no use simply saying we are doing our best. You must succeed in doing what is necessary. 
And what is necessary is to repudiate the mullahs, keep the promises made to the MEK, support a regime change so that a democratic non-nuclear Iran can live in peace with its neighbors and in harmony with the rest of the world. We are proud. We are proud to join you, Madam Rajavi, as you lead the effort to replace the evil and the tyranny of the mullahs and the distortion of your proud and honorable religion with a democratic government committed to the sacred values of peace, harmony, and justice. It's been an honor to be with you this evening. Thank you very much.